College of Agriculture. And as you know, that is a joint effort of the Institute for Plant Sciences, Digital Forestry, and Digital Agriculture. And so, uh, as you see on the screen here, we have a uh, number of uh, what look like excellent things coming up. And you were excited about a couple of them that are coming up. And, and so they cover uh, teaching, research. I don't think we have any uh, extension, but I mean, that's usually a component uh, of all of them. But um, I don't know if you can, it's scrolled. Can you scroll back? Um, oh, sorry. Um, in a couple, three weeks, we will have uh, an internal speaker, Wang Lin, from our Department of Data Science Consulting Services. And then as you can see, we have a digital forestry offering, and then there's one for plant sciences, a person coming from the Danforth Center. So uh, today we're really excited to have uh, Diane Wang. She's a colleague of mine in the Department of Agronomy just down the hall. And I know she's doing some really great stuff with teaching. And uh, she's also uh, doing a lot of work with research, too. And so I'm standing right in front of you, Diane. This is a little bit awkward here. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I need to... We're a little rusty after a break of the summer, aren't we? Here? Yeah, it's I am. So... Uh, <laughs> Diane has a couple of degrees uh, from Cornell. She joins a growing group of people in our department that are working on digital agricultural things. And uh, you can read the uh, rest of it uh, on her description in the announcement. And so, uh, Diane, please go ahead and take it away. Computational thinking for undergraduates in the natural sciences. And yes, it must be for everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, let me just take a moment to work out the, the screen share because I know I'm not screen sharing, right? No, you're not. We figured this out before everyone arrived, but now I've lost it. We shared a PDF. So if I do this, yeah, so I'm not right, right, right. Okay, so thank you guys so much for coming. Um, all right, I'm going to do that. Um, I usually give seminars on research and not teaching. So this is my first, really my first teaching seminar and all the slides are brand new, fresh out of the oven today. So um, Bruce introduced me already. My name is Diane Wong. I'm the assistant professor in the Department of Agronomy. I started here at Purdue in January, 2020, which is wonderful timing on my part. Um, the world since has collapsed and rebuilt. So we're all here again now. I'm very happy about that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about my course, Agronomy 420. It's a new class. It's got a permanent number as of this year, and it has been run as an Agronomy 598 over the last two years. It's called Computing for Natural Sciences. Okay. Okay, so we're not for today. We're going to be talking about computational thinking, what you did is it, and why is it important for our students, especially our undergraduate. And I feel a little bit about the philosophy, the philosophy of the design of the Grammy 420, and also what I've learned so far in the last three years of or two years plus of running this course. And hopefully, we can have a little bit of discussion about best practices and what you guys, um, maybe you guys can share some tips and tricks as well. Um, Bruce and Ben wanted me to share some resources that are available for teaching, computing, and R that are available online, as well as touch upon some programs here at Purdue which are related and there are a great number of courses that students can take. Okay, so first of all, a disclaimer, I'm not a computer scientist. I don't have a degree in CS. My degrees are in plant breeding and genetics and then I'm post off in the geography department. I work with plants. Um, and so why am I here talking to you today about computational thinking? So I did take one CS off. <laughs> I took it during graduate school. It was um, a first year computer science class in MATLAB required for all incoming engineering students at Cornell. And so this was a class of three to 400 students. It was in the engineering college. I was very intimidated, but I found it incredibly useful. And so I tried to develop the class by taking the most useful element of this course, so really the first half, and building it into a natural science context. So even though I'm not a computer scientist, I have taken um, and applied a lot of this computational thinking in my work as a graduate student, later as my post, and later as a postdoc, 
where we developed um, process-based models. So computer simulation models of plant behavior, how plants respond to different environmental signals over time. So we did a lot of things. And I wanted to pay that forward to my students here and share that with the Purdue community. Okay, so about the definitions of computational thinking, roaming around the internet there, this is probably my favorite from this company, learning.com. And um, they define it as a process of identifying a very clear and defined step-by-step -step solution to a complex problem. And they break it down and say that it's made up of four parts. So we have a solution of this complex problem is small bits. Recognizing patterns so that we can then make your work a little bit more efficient, abstracted. Mm -hmm. So taking, looking at that complexity and taking the most salient details from that. Um, and then finally, algorithm development, where we take our process and then actually code it up. And so I really like this because this is a lot of what we do in my class. And as I stress to my students, one of whom is sitting right here, so if you just heard me talk for 75 minutes and she's back again. So I guess I must not be that bad. Um, but I stress to my students that this is not about typing away the computer and getting the code right. It's really about that logic building that underlies that precedes, you know, converting it into code that the computer can run. So we spend a lot of time on building logic, whether that's in human understandable words or pseudocode, before we do the last bit, the last five percentages to get it into the right code. Okay, so <clears throat> one example is an illuminating. An illuminating example that we talk about in the very first day of class. So the prerequisites for programming for my class is none, absolutely none. So where do we begin? We begin by going back towards going back to concepts that everyone can get a handle on. Everyone can take a high school math. We start with the problem of the square root. So this is actually something we all take for granted, right? We compute square roots plugging for our computer phone or whatever, and there it comes. Um, and we, you know, memorize our times tables when we were little, and we know that the square root of 49 is seven, and that's all good and dandy, but what about something more complicated like 43? We can, we don't remember that. And we kind of know it's between, we look at closer to seven and six. We don't have really any intuition beyond that, any more specificity beyond that. And so it actually is a complex problem, but can we, do we have the tools to be able to break that down and solve it with just a regular calculator that can do plus minus any division and multiplication? Um, and the answer is we could. So we, we go through this illuminating problem in that first class. So we make an observation that if A is the square, an area of the square, then we can just simply measure the side length. Of course, we don't have the perfect square with an area of 23 that's really awkward to compute. So what we can do though is make rectangles. And we make a series like increasingly square rectangles so that we, as we clarify those rectangles, we know that the sides are to converge onto the side, onto the square root of A. So what that looks like in visually is we start with a third rectangle, which we know is whose area is 43, which is simply a really long skinny rectangle whose width is one and whose length is 43. And we step by step make it more square by using our logic, and we know that somewhere, um, you know, that square root of 43 is somewhere between the short, the short width and the long length, right? And so we can say, well, somewhere in between that, so I'll just say, I'll update my my net square by saying that my next length is going to be half of somewhere in between these two values is going to be half of that. And I'm going to update my next width because we know that the relationship between the length and width is this link right here, the area. We just take A divided by the new length, we get the new width, and so on and so forth. We do this four times. We take the average and we get out 6.65. If we actually compute the square root of A, which is a calculator, it's about 6.55. So that's pretty close. So just in four easy steps, by doing some arithmetic, we can get really close to an answer that is a solution to the problem that's actually pretty complex. I want to click this, but it's not working. Okay. Um, okay, and so we, we walk through this in my class as like that first illuminating example. And so we, we do it visually, we talk about it, we draw it out, we do it visually, then we apply some real numbers to apply some intuition, and then we generalize, right? We say, what is that recipe? I mean, we can put our numbers, we know how variables, and then finally we code it out and run it. And so this is before anyone has touched R or knows anything about coding, but it's a simple enough example that you can really kind of wrap your mind around it. And Okay, so um, 
the kind of overview of how we first need to do the math sciences. It's a basic programming class um, using R. We go over very fundamental topics such as iteration, um, functions, both built in and user defined functions, as well as data objects, algorithms, strings, algorithm development. We do do some plotting and reproducible reports in R. So I'll go over kind of the overall flow of this course. So it's designed really for undergrads with a curiosity in programming, but also who want to get involved or are involved in research because we do a term project that is really um, data data center. And um, but it's also for the undergraduate students who haven't maybe you know, maybe they've had some exposure to R, but maybe never took one kind of programming class. Mm -hmm. it's really the aim is to lower the barriers so that it's not it's not scary. You know, it's kind of scary. It was scary for me to take a class in the PS department. I felt really out of place. Um, and so this is a class that I designed because I wish it was something that I have and I'm someone. Okay, and um, of course, I'm not a computer scientist and as many research faculty, um, I was not trained as a, as, a, as a teacher, I guess, formally. So we kind of all kind of bumble through. So in order to model after something that I knew worked well, the first half of the course was designed after CS101, which was that MATLAB class that I took. And so Daisy Fan, she is a really good teacher. She has won numerous and numerous figures. I kind of modeled this after her. I'm on the right track. So what I did was I translated out everything in Star. We use something called Posit Cloud, which is a cloud-based Star Studio server. And so this enables us, my students and I, to share projects. It enables me to reach out into their projects to help them debug if we're you know not in class time. It gets around a lot of issues of local dependencies. Um, and of course, the important thing about this class is prior program is not pretty. All right, so the overview of the class is the first half is basically we focus on the fundamentals of computing, again, um, functions, iteration, conditionals, etc. The, the latter half is really focusing on data. So working with data, both using base R, R packages, and then R markdown. And then throughout the course, we also have alongside like, this course project where students change the data set on their um long the length of the, the guidelines, I guess. And then, then la the latter part of the talk is really focused on developing kind of fundamental project in R markdown so they talk. A reproducible report with narrative and code chunks. And, and then, if you, I don't know, you can actually see, but basically, the lectures go on to the first level, and it would be the third class of that. So then, about two lectures to discuss the topic, and then it's allowed to really cement and um, very shocking. And then, you have to apply the skills that they've done. Okay, so I want to share a little bit about what I found doesn't work well first. My first year, I came up with something called virtual app. This was not taken well, I think. <laughs> um, so I thought, oh, I want to, you know, call on students and have them volunteer some answers. But people were quite shy. It was still COVID. We were all masked. Um, so I thought, well, I could have like a hat, right? Just pick name, random. Then it's not my fault that I chose someone. But then I thought, well, we should practice what you preach. So let's make a virtual hat. So I had this list. In R, and I would run this program to make out a name, but apparently that created a lot of anxiety. So I dropped out of the question. Virtual had a thought. Um, I found that the lectures that didn't hit home as well were the ones that didn't have enough like hands on activities. So 75 minute class is a long time to listen to me yap. And I also don't want to do that for 75 minutes. So I try to like punctuate it with hands on activities, but some lectures it was harder for me to come up with hands on activities than others, and the ones that didn't. It was it was clear that I was a little bit more uninspired after I after I ended it. So and then I would say the third thing that I found challenging was um, how to engage and how international students um, learn in this class because I think so much of what we try to do this problem solving all the details are contained in that problem statement and many of many of times you really have to go in and, and try to really understand. There's a lot that's baked in, but I think, and, and language is a really important part of that. So I think I, I would like to hear from you guys about maybe what strategies you have to to help international students learn a subject matter like this. 
um, besides including actually helping author about and things like that. So those are kind of the three things that I found uh, I'm still working on and I'm still trying to figure out better ways to call on volunteers without putting people on the spot. And I definitely don't want to make students anxious. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what I have found that does work well. Okay, so what we do in the beginning of the class is um, I, I implement an initial intake survey. And this has been really enlightening because even though there are no prerequisites, many of times students come in with some experience, with some familiarity with R or programming in, in other languages. And so that's really important for me to know. Um, because in labs, we try to pair students up together, and sometimes it's very helpful to pair up people who have some experience with those who haven't to try to foster that peer-to-peer -peer learning. And then we do student introductions in the Brightspace forum where there's a series of questions. And so this is really that initial, like, getting a pulse on, on the class. In my intake server, we, we just have four questions. So I hand out the next part. The first is, do you have any experience programming with several languages? The second and third are asked about loops and the anatomy of the function. And then the fourth one is a little problem that it's all right here. It's very simple. Um, not everyone gets it right though. And that allows me to kind of get a sense because if you just ask the first question, that doesn't show you how much people have obtained, really what level. Maybe they took a class in statistics where they used some packages or were able to modify code to, to run a regression or something like that. Um, and so the, the second two really get asked whether they've had a course on fundamentals of programming. Okay, and so what I do is I take the index cards back and then I kind of recode them into the first year was one to four and then the second two semesters were one to five. And then I chose the spot for the next class, just so the class gets a sense. And I think that so many times we take surveys and then you never see the results and you're like, well, I just spent some time doing that. I'd love to, I'd love to know where it's even. And so over the course of um, the last three running of this class, it seems like at least this term, my, my class is, is quite a bit more experienced than before. So I'm pretty excited about that because I think we can push a little bit more and get more, a little bit more creative with examples. So, but of course, this is like, you know, it's so much fun. It's not really a survey, but I did the best I can. You know, it's sort of subjective in terms of how you map the, the answers to the one through five. Okay, and then on Brightspace, we ask a series of questions, including why are you doing this course? So I took the responses from the last three years and I threw them into a word cloud. And it seems like um, if it's a lot cloud, this could be, you know, are we hitting the demographic of students that I was targeting, which would be under Brightspace and research, potentially going to research. And so, some of the, the words that popped out were they mentioned that they want to develop the skills in the fundamentals of programming in order to analyze data. This is important and valuable for their future career work and research and sciences. And so um, I was pretty pleased to see that because this is the type of student that we're trying to recruit. As I mentioned, the lectures are punctuated with hands-on problem solving. We try to implement as much as we can. It does stretch my creativity though coming up with these problems. So it'll hopefully just get better year after year. And so they are these your turn questions. Um, they're always, they're um, always orange colored. And so that formatting I think is helpful because you know, if you're there, you're in a lecture, you're kind of absorbing as you guys are all sitting here listening to me talk. But then we look the next slide and it's orange. And they're like, oh, now it's time for me to turn my brain on and do something, right? So they're, they're kind of like worn before, before I say anything. Um, so sometimes this occurs in pairs, the, the more involved problems, um, where you might want a partner to kind of bounce ideas off of so you're not just spinning your own head. And sometimes they're easier, which are just problems that are like, hey, you know, wake up, let's do, let's wake the brain up a little bit, not the cobwebs. And then the, in the last year, these are two new things that I tried, which was the first was live creating a student code before exam one. And this was, um, an in-class problem that they worked on. And then rather than just discussing the answer or me showing the solution on the board, we we asked for volunteers and I would put it up on, there's not one in this room, but you know, those things that look like overhead projectors. And then I would go through and I would talk out loud how I would grade this because um, most people have not 
written pseudocode and they don't know how that's graded because we're grading for logic and not, you know, does this thing run on the computer. So getting to see that live and seeing like what I'm looking for was really helpful to them. And it turned out that everyone wanted to volunteer. Like I thought maybe people would be really shy to have their stuff graded, but they, they got a kick out of it. So like, oh, huh, I got that right, I got that wrong. And um, this was group work, so it wasn't any one individual. And so they all wanted to see their stuff graded live. Um, and the second was, the new thing from last year was to have take home questions at the end of the, the lectures. So we showed the, the take home question in the lectures so that they're, it's not the first time they've seen it at home. And then they, they take it back, they, they, they do it, and then they review it the next time. Just to get more practice, because in a, a topic like this, you really can't learn it if you're just listening to me. Okay, so here's one example of a pretty straightforward, like we got questions, so part of the orange part. Um, so this is just asking about which are following for proper call, and they get probably a minute to do this. So it's just it's just quick. It's not um, this one is not involved. So there are a lot many times that the questions are just one minute or two minutes. And then something like this, if this is actually in the same lecture um, on user defined functions, this is a little bit more involved. So in this case, we ask them to pair up. They they write their own function. This is all on paper, and then they use that in a in a program that runs a simulation basically. And then we we did the live grading for this. So they had 12 minutes to do this. The take home question in example here is simply, you know, I show this as part of the slides and then it's kind of fun to get to get a preview of what they're gonna be doing. And then this, they know they, they do it because they know that someone's gonna be called on in the next lecture to, to lead the discussion. Okay, so that's for lectures. So we also have labs about every third class, and this is done in pairs. In the first lab this year, um, they pick their own partners. In the subsequent lab, we will likely pair them up. Um, they're made to be challenging, but technically doable within the class period. So most of them can get checked off. These are checked off for completion and not for correctness, because it's really, it's sort of like auto tutorial. It's really meant to serve um, they're studying. <clears throat> I have to say, and then this is a nice, the labs are nice because we can incorporate much, many more examples from the natural sciences, whereas in the lectures where we're really first introducing concepts, the, the examples we use are uh, largely derived from math or just very generic examples. And I have to say that Posit Cloud, which is the platform that we use, is really awesome. I want to show you guys um, some of its features. Um, but here's just one example of a lab that uh, we just did on Tuesday. So this was lab one in which we implemented or incorporated a, an example from the natural sciences. So in this case, they're they're writing a program to compute vapor pressure deficit using user input of temperature and Fahrenheit, and then they have to do a conversion within the program to Celsius, and then um, the relative humidity. And it just so happened that we were just a few days after that 98 degree horrifically humid Thursday. So, um, so yeah, so labs are fun. They're fun for me as well because I can try to come up with creative examples. This year we have two entomologists, so I'm trying to figure out a way to, to maybe, so we just finished conditionals today and so our lab for conditionals will be next Thursday. So I'm thinking like maybe some kind of insect taxonomy, like if you have two wings, then, you know, return Diptera. I don't know, I haven't thought this out yet, but I'm pretty excited. So, um, so those are the labs. Okay, so Posit Cloud. This is just an awesome service. We've used this for the class the whole time because originally I was trying to find the computer lab and then somehow that didn't work out. Um, okay, so basically this is browser-based, so you do not, the students just need a computer that can access the internet. And so this is a picture of my browser. And um, so here's Posit Cloud. Um, this is my view of it, so in this case, you can see that there's a bunch of labs. And lab one has the blue, grant you have, um, these are white over here. And this one says you can see space members and ha can have access to it. And then these are private because I've not made them available. So anything that's not private, that is available to space members, the whole class can view. And because it's labeled as an assignment, when they click on it, it creates a derived copy. So then every student has their own copy of exactly this lab, all the content in it. 
So whatever I want to implement there that I want to share, I make it before the lab and everyone gets like a little clone of it. And then they work on their own copy. So each student can view their own project um, and me and my TA can view everyone's. Okay, so when you enter one of these projects in your lab, <laughs> here's, here we're looking at this one. So, least. so here we're looking at lab one. Um, you can see it looks just like our studio, like a local or a standalone version of our studio. So that's pretty nice. And then in here, these are the ones that I provided for them that are associated with that lab class. So when they open it up, they'll see all this and they can just use it without having to download, you know, copies from right face or whatever. And then they can also save their own solutions in here. So in the labs, we ask them to develop their own programs, they'll save them and then we can jump in and, and view them. Okay, so from when I'm looking at the rest of the content, these are labs that students have created. You can see that they're individual student names and these are labeled private and you can see where they're direct from, which is my lab. Okay, so even though this is a computing class, we do a lot of work on the computer and on paper, there are two sort of enrichment classes. Um, hang on, let me get rid of this. Okay, so um, there are two sort of enrichment classes. One is the field trip near, I think, end of November, no, maybe beginning of November, we take a trip to the Ad Alumni Phenotyping Facility. For those of you who haven't been there, big growth chambers where plants are growing and move around on conveyor belts and get imaged by RGB imaging, hyperspectral. It's really cool. And then the facility gives you gobs of data. And so this comes at a time, I think mid-November, early November, when, I don't know, we're all kind of a little bit tired from the semester. And we've sort of made that transition into focusing on course projects. And there's not as much content that are really fundamental in the class. So we use this as an opportunity for the students to see where large data sets come from and also take a little bit of a mental break from just sitting and doing the lecture same as uh, the other times. So so Dr. Yang Yang does a great job of giving the tour and then the facility managers um, help out as well. And then we always have an AAPF postdoc provide a little bit of a guest lecture as well. So maybe 30 minutes of a tour, 30 minutes of a guest lecture. And the students really enjoy, I mean, who doesn't want to go and see this facility that <laughs> plants running around on conveyor belts? It's, it's really neat. So that's one. And then the other is a guest lecture. So we invite a postdoc who's working in modeling to give a guest lecture. And this really illustrates the possibilities of what you can do with programming. So the first year we had Ron Kui Han come and she had done her PhD um, analyzing strong imagery data on lettuce plants, on large diversity panels of lettuce and, and identifying the uh, genetic architecture underlying the time of day when lettuce flowers. So it's the flower o'clock. So not time to flowering, but time of day, which is important in terms of in the context of abiotic stress. So you can avoid flowering at certain times of day that is more stressful than you're a winner. So um, I think that's really fun. So that happens usually early December. So meanwhile, the students are chugging along on their, on their course projects, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So now we've made it well into mid-semester. Now the shift is from the fundamentals to application of skills culminating in a term project. So in the, I don't know, not very beginning, but around October, students select a data set and we provide guidelines as to what that data set should look like. So for us, A, it must be of interest to the student, of academic interest. So whether they are from entomology or animal science or agronomy, a, a data set that is of interest to them and useful potentially, you know, wherever their long-term career goals are. Um, the second is, I have to remember the second. <laughs> the second is it has to have two, three continuous and two categorical variables, I think, just so we know we, we can, we are able to do the types of plot that we wanna do. And the third parameter that they need to fit is that they have to be able to at least theoretically come up with two testable hypotheses. They don't, we don't do any formal hypothesis testing in this class, it's not a stats class. But at least in terms of the plotting that we want to do, we want to at least be able to um, discuss the potential questions that we have of data. Okay, so these are the parameters. 
And then because like the term projects, students have always competing priorities, especially by the end of the semester. And so we bake in checkpoints. So there are three checkpoints for the project and they start in mid-September, which is coming up, Alex. <laughs> so the first one is simply, so the first two are graded like if you did or if you didn't do it. And the third one is actually graded on a, a scored. So the first one is um, send me an email to set up a meeting. That's it. If they sent me an email by that deadline to set up a meeting, we set up a meeting, they get those points. The second is show up to your meeting. And we have a 30 minute discussion about your data. They come with a potential data set and we discuss it. Because these data sets are so individual, it's really important to have these one-on-one -on -one, um, discussions. And because sometimes it takes two or three iterations to get the right data set. Because even <laughs> though I provide the guidelines, sometimes it doesn't make sense to people. It made sense to me, but that, that's just me, I guess. Um, yeah. Um, and then the third is an outline. So the outline is the one that's graded and that's due, I can't remember how long before the term project is due, but that's due well before the term project. Um, and that way they can already get feedback on what they want to do. So it's kind of like the outline outlines what they want to do. And then the project is them executing it. And so we try to bake these kind of low stakes assessments into, into the course. And the examples of, um, yeah, the, the project data sets have been great. I, I, this is really my favorite part of the semester is being able to not be the one in the front of the room, but to be in the audience and watching them um, kind of showcase the skills that they've developed all semester long and, and talk about the data they're interested in. And so the examples from previous students have been very diverse. We've had a project on ice cover of the Great Lakes and the Arctic, which I knew nothing about, um, photosynthesis and geography um, from this large ecological database, the nutrient composition of animal protein meals by um, a student who is very interested in, in swine production, K rates in corn and soybean from a student from our very own department, and then maternal and paternal effects in English walnut, which is also really interesting. And this year, I can tell you that it's gonna be even better because we have a, um, a woman who is has been brewing beer with sorghum and she does research on this, which is awesome, but we're not allowed to drink it. Um, a bumblebee researcher and then a um, microbiologist. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the projects. Okay, so the outputs of this course project is designed so that students have kind of a package they can take with them, whether, you know, um, interviewing for internships. So last year, a student had been interviewing for an internship that he wanted to take next summer, and the guy was really excited about him taking this class. So they, he, that person, the future employer, actually gave him some data to work on in this class, which was fun. That was the long that one. So um, the out, that, that package has three parts. It's the formatted data set. It is the R markdown source file that then goes to render this output HTML file that then has the, the narrative and the, the plots and example code chunks. And so um, I think this is really useful. Even, even if it's not useful for like interviews and stuff, it, it's kind of useful for uh, reference for themselves later on. If they're like, oh yeah, I took that class and we did some analysis, let me go back to it. And it's all reproducible. Okay, so here is just um, a visual example. So here's the, the source file. This is from the student, a meteorologist who wanted to investigate, um, ask questions about ice cover in the Great Lakes and the Arctic. So here's your source file and that goes to render this HTML and I pulled out some, at least one plot from that. If you, it, it goes on and on and on, but this is from one of them. Okay, so there are many resources online that are free. Um, a really good one is R4, R4DS, R4 Data Science, that's that first one. We do have a couple of readings in my class um, from that book. The other two we don't use in my class, but I provide them as part of the syllabus as other references for the students. So I, I get emails that are like, oh, I can't take your class because of this and this, there's a conflict. So I always send them these references to, to because they're pretty much auto tutorial. You can just read through them, follow the examples, and you'll be good to go. Wanted to touch on some other programs available here at Purdue. So there is the data driven app miner. Um, the links are here. And then secondly, there's a certificate applications of data science. Dennis and Bruce are your go-tos for that if you guys are interested or have questions. But here is the just a snapshot of the uh, the miner. There are 21 credits required 
across a, a selection of different areas. And then, and then for the applications and data science certificate, that's a little bit less number of credits, in, but it's kind of the same setup, um, slightly different areas. Okay, I don't have too much more, but I wanted to summarize this up and say that thinking computationally is fun and useful. You don't need to be a computer scientist. It need not be scary. And so my course, Agronomy 420, is an attempt for to lower those barriers for students of the natural sciences. And I think he is um, just implementing lots and lots of student practice and low stakes assessment so that they get feedback um, continuously. Okay, so I just wanted to go and thank um, my previous students, especially the ones from 2021. That was an interesting year for all of us and they were really the guinea pigs. Um, but they, they made it through the first offering of this class as well as my students from this year who let me paparazzi them at the lab uh, on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Sam Schaefer, who is a wonderful TA and the course really wouldn't be the same without him. So now is time for discussion and questions and comments. Yeah, okay. okay, thank you, Dr. Mon, for mm -hmm. your uh, uh, informative session. And who has questions here for Diane? About any teaching? About uh, I've got a couple up my sleeve, of course. Uh, if you don't have any, take, uh, yeah, go ahead. So I see 12 students. Is that how many you have in your current class? Mm -hmm. Are you capping the course? For I think it's capped at 20, maybe. Or 20. Or now that you're in a virtual environment, you get 500. Forgot to be with them about their data. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's not scalable. That's thank yeah. you, thank you, guys. Yeah. That, that's interesting. So 12, and then and it sounds like you're getting them across the college. Yes, this year, yeah. It's just, I mean, I've only done this three times, and it, they've just been different every year. The first year was very diverse from across the college. The second year was almost entirely all plant breeding and genetic students. And then this year is the from across the college again. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how that's happening. <laughs> Can I ask one more question? Yeah, yeah. So is this course in the curriculum requirements for any of the majors? Oh, so, okay. Thank you for that question. So um, I've been working with Dennis and Bruce. Yeah, to get it's it. being added. It's being added yeah. to both those two, uh, that certificate and that data-driven ag minor. Right. Yeah. So it will be. It's not. It's the not University online. University certificate and yes. our college data driven planner. I was just wondering. I'm an advisor in the plant breeding genetics uh, major, and this is the kind of course I don't know where it would fit in the major in terms of the kinds of things that it would <laughs> it might be considered as covering. But one of the things that's important, I think, that is in getting a class like this as it as it comes together, so it takes a little bit to come together. It looks like it's coming together. That if you want uh, consistent and substantial participation is to get it into into the major the curriculum requirements mm -hmm. and otherwise it's kind of a which is fine i mean it serve i mean it'll serve its purpose being in the curriculum with these two and the certificate and the, the minor but this seems like a, a unique course that we want to get into lots of majors mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a meeting at three o'clock today, as many of you know, to discuss the digital agronomy concentration. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of you in the room were in that meeting. Any, any, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, when your base class offered in the same semester, and it's first? only offered in this fall, okay. and it's two times a week. We meet um, just next door across the street in Biochem 102 from 12 to 115. So I think it's not too late to sign up for the semester. I don't know about deadlines and stuff, but we're only in week two. So if you know friends and colleagues who are might be interested, yeah, I can send them my way. We can have a chat about you know what they've missed and how we can make up. I do that three credit course. It's three credits, yeah. So Diane, I really enjoyed your discussion about your teaching methods, and I love that you focused on. Um, not the coding so much, but what's behind the coding and the thought process that goes behind that. And so I'm, I'm curious, you say you have like a, a fairly small number of students, like 12 students mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, 
What, what if you had um, like 50 students or something like that? Would, <clears throat> would you be able to, um, like, I, I'm just thinking about how you might teach this to a larger class. And then I'm also thinking about how you might teach something like this online, because there's quite an em emphasis of moving stuff online. So any, <laughs> I told you I'd have a zinger for you. So Daisy, who's absolutely, she's just, she's amazing. She's, she's the Cornell. She's the Cornell yeah, yep. professor. She teaches, yeah, like 400 students. So she's yeah. up there on the stage doing her thing. And then yeah. so all the your turn questions are their clicker questions. Um, the only difference is the labs are all run by TAs and there are a million sections. And so, you know, the quality of that can, can vary depending on the TA. I found the labs were... They were good, but her lectures were better because it's just she's got that. She had that personality. She was a great teacher. Mm -hmm. So um, so it is possible. I, I don't know yeah. if I'm the one for that necessarily. Yeah. Um, I, I really like that. I know there's going to be quite a difference when you scale it up. But yeah. It really can change it. Yeah. And so. especially as Dennis mentioned with the course projects, like I really like to have that one on one meeting for yeah. to, to discuss the. The nature of the data set so that's something that's not found in like an intro cs class that whole last half of the semester is really mm -hmm. unique to this class and not um not a general fundamental cs class so i think it's possible if you want to like split the class and maybe make two half semester courses where to take the second one you have to have taken the first one the first one can be a very very large class potentially and then the second one is a more it's a small class for people who want to continue on with data sets and things like that so that's one option that i could imagine then right. that number is still small and mm -hmm. give enough time to each student because i think that's the best part of the class i think mm -hmm. okay more questions yeah i just have like one suggestion because one of the things that you mentioned in your presentation is that so some international students yeah. have been struggling with that so from my experience while well, i've been here like since 20 and in 2020, from 2019, that I started my master. And one of the things that I struggled with in my first years uh, is because sometimes, like, there are like many things that we need to do. And for us to understand, I think that sometimes we need a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. So if I remember my first paper that I read here, it took me like one week to finish right now. Um, I can I can read it like in an hour or an hour and a half or something yeah. like that. So I think that's something that you can consider is okay. giving like a little bit more time to extra time on that. Okay, that's a good point. Thank you. Diane, what are the biggest skills gaps that you see? Not only like of students that are coming into your class, but what are you hearing from employers or where they your students end up, what what is the biggest need that we need to address here to get them, you know, up to speed on everything that we're wanting them to do? Um, so from the employer perspective, I don't know about that because I've no one's talked to me about that yet. Yeah. I guess future employers don't talk to me, but I think at least in terms of like incoming graduate students. So I partly designed this class because um, my first graduate student hadn't had any experience in in coding, and we all, you know, we found each other in the pandemic, and it was sort of a whirlwind. And so we sat down one on one, and I went through all these things with her, and I thought this would be a lot better if I, there was just a class for it. And so this was designed partly to fill that gap, and then that way, if you have incoming graduate students, for example, who haven't had any experience programming, I can just enroll them in this class. And then I know that they they've received the same like sort of standard background, so that's sort of a roundabout answer to that. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Bruce? Because I think you probably have more contact with potentially future. I probably employers. have a little more contact with employers, but it's yeah. more from the agribusiness standpoint and not from the data skills stand standpoint. So I don't know if mm -hmm. I feel qualified to answer that. I guess the thing that I hear from um, many employers is they, they don't have the basic understanding of the context of the data okay. that, that they, you know, maybe are good at programming and can work with data and come up with conclusions, but they may not have a good understanding of crop growth and development okay. or, 
nutrient movement in the soil or some of the basic agronomic uh, or forestry principles or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make sure that the data is correct for the context that they're working in. Okay, I see. Yeah, so. It's kind of the opposite, the other end of yeah. the Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I work more on the opposite. And that's like <clears throat> where my online classes address that uh, mm -hmm. situation. So. Okay. Does anyone else have anything to add in terms of like what the what gaps you see in from your students that are coming in, or um, if you've had any interaction with future employers? I was going to ask the question the other way, which is you've got twenty or thirty students the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Which students have performed the best? Is there a group of students that I mean? I was I was wondering, for, did, is there a staff requirement or not? So there is a stat requirement, but it's um you can work around that. Like if you've taken high school stat, I'll let you in. <laughs> it's not a stat class. Um, but I don't want it to be the first time they've heard of you know the word distribution. That's all. It's we don't do any stats. But um, so yes, this year there is a stat requirement, and I think maybe that's why the you know the level of in terms of previous programming experience has bumped up from this year because the last two years. There wasn't really a prerequisite because it was an experimental class. And so, you know, it said like some previous background required. Um, oh, wait, I forgot what the question was. Which students seem like they're, oh. I, I'm looking at some of the pictures and then some of your, some of your uh, descriptions of students, I think I know who those students are. Okay. I'm just wondering, were there some students that were, seemed like they were, most of these are agronomy students, it looks like. You're not getting them, or not agronomy, sorry. College of Agriculture students. Yeah. You're not getting engineering students, or? No, I mean, the first semester, you know, Bilal, no, you don't know Bilal. Bilal is Chief Trickover, he oh. took it, and he had like a lot of experience programming. But so I was, I was encouraging him to drop the class, actually. But he still got from me out of it because he didn't use R. He he used Python and C and other other languages. But he wanted to he wanted he took it because he was curious about the plant side because mm. it used to be called, it had a different name. It was like plant state and competition, something very long and wordy. And then it turned out that maybe this is useful for people who are beyond like beyond plant scientists. So we we generalized it this year. So I don't know if I can say that because it's it was I've only had the you know the three times and. The student composition has been so different each time. So well, I know what the plant breeding genetic students are, are their, their training is like. Mm -hmm. So these are juniors and seniors mostly, I think. Yes. Yeah. Are they prepared to take the class? They're good, but you know, there's always a distribution. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a last question from Christian Hadlon. Um, more of a comment. Um, I thank you for your really wonderful presentation. It's really delightful listening to you. And, and with that, I think every single student in our college at, at least should take your class. And that brings me to the problem of the scale up. I think which I think you asked about. I think uh, asking particularly the senior faculty members here, if we talk to our administrators to provide some incentive to even assistant professor to scale up those classes. We currently have no system in place to make it any any uh, more, more uh, worth your while to teach 12 students or to teach 1,200. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we need to address to make it possible for you to still enjoy teaching. <laughs> and from one experience, teaching very large classes can be kind of draining and not as satisfying as being in, in a small group, but as the college needs and, and the stakeholders expect our students to be trained in those areas, mm -hmm. we need to find a system to reward the professors of, of any level to take one large class and scale them up. Uh, and, and I would say you, you, you're just as good as the Cornell professor you mentioned there, I think, in your teaching skills. Um, so I don't know what, what to do about it, but next time you talk to Christine Wilson or any of the other administrators mentioning that we need to have some incentive to uh, make those classes more accessible to students uh, across disciplines, at least in our college. And I should probably let our my department head make a comment. Did you have a comment, Jeff? Well, I was going to go back to the you know one of the producers' industry department need, and then right on the Wall Street Journal yesterday that addressed this in agriculture. Uh, it's very interesting. Farmers are just bombarded with 
these were data outings for the numbers. Yeah, I saw that article. Yeah. And and it's they're just overwhelmed. And, and the real challenge for them is aligns nicely with what you're doing, Diane, because it, it's the thinking behind how to take numbers, data, and do convert it to actionable knowledge. That's really the hang up. And right now, uh, the concern is that we will never we are not well positioned to do anything with AI and machine learning because we can't make that first step about distilling it down to some reasonable questions. And so it's an interesting article, uh, but I think your course really lands nicely in helping with solving that problem. Thank you. For can that. I offer a quick comment too? I think so. There, I think we can go till 20 out. Um, so to Christian's point, yes, it would be great to scale it up. But my hope is through presentations like yours today and the series, each of us to teach something like I wrote down a couple of things that I want to infuse in my course. It's not about R, but it is about computational thinking where I could teach a little bit better using some approaches that you did. So if, and we would have courses covering some of this, hopefully in all the majors in the College of Act. It, we do quantitative things these days, what it will, and to do it in a logical way and, and with code. So if we can each at least ratchet up until the day where this is at scale for everybody, we can at least make progress. Mm -hmm. I think. And we have new faculty who have joined and who, my colleague Patti is right there who, who are developing right. new classes. So yes. I think, yeah. America's farmers are bogged down by data. Is that the one you're, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so I, I'm bogged down by data, mm -hmm. yeah. so. Okay, well, it's good to see. I think every student in your class, uh, Diane, is, has a big smile on their face there in your picture. So I might have asked them to smile. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're up there waving your arms. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's give her another round of uh, thanks. <laughs>